just enough to introduce Bonnie Ambrose, who happened to be in the class of 2017 with me. Any other 2017? Woo, woo. <laughs> so Bonnie is an experienced Master Gardener veteran, and she is an experienced vegetable and herb enthusiast as well. And I have learned so much from your last presentation on herbs, and I just can't wait to learn more about vegetable gardening today from Bonnie because fall in Texas is a wonderful time for vegetable gardening. So come on up, Bonnie, and teach us. Well, I think you all have to give yourself a big round of applause for sticking it out today. So let's just applaud yourselves. Um, I'd also like um, to thank uh, Global Spheres, Daniel, for um, helping organize. He was a volunteer extraordinaire to, uh, to get this program organized, do training. So he needs a big round of support. Um, And I will also say, I always get by with a little help from my friends in a presentation. Uh, I always love when they're master gardeners in here because they always know much more than I do. And if you have a suggestion or somebody asks something and I look stumped, please feel free. Um, that is what is so great about being a master gardener. Uh, and I would like to say I'm a big time learner. All right. So when when people say I'm experienced, I say the the best thing about being a master gardener is you get to learn, and that is always my my first. Uh, I always say I have a commercial because we're all all about commercials uh, before we give a free presentation. You know how they always things are free. Well, our commercial is all about learning about what's available to you, whether you're a master gardener or not. Uh, if you don't, uh, there's lots of information in the back. I pulled this. We give you a pen as well as information. So you're going to be able to find this presentation online. Um, so after this, if you go out to dcmga.com, you can find out lots of stuff. I'm going to give a presentation about vegetable gardening in one hour. So you know I'm not going to give you everything you need to know. But what I am going to do is give you things to think about. Things that when you when you wonder why something isn't growing, if you go back and you look at some of the things um, that that's in this presentation, you say, well, maybe it's my soil. Maybe I'm giving it too much water. Maybe I'm doing this. So that's, I, I just want you to know that you can't learn everything you know, need to know in one hour. Okay, deal? All right, good. I understood the last presenter did singing. I am not, I, I am not a singer. I would clear the room for sure. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, advertisement I'll do is become, want to be a master gardener, please join us. Please join us. We are going to have a informational center uh, session here on the 14th. So you you know where this is. Come and meet more Master Gardeners on the 14th and learn more about this organization. Okay, so let's, uh, copies, I said to you, you get copies of this presentation. I pulled it right off of our website. Sometimes I do my own. This one was so good and so comprehensive. So if you don't get something or you don't, what, what was that note? Please know that it is on our uh, website right here, Fall Vegetable Gardening, okay? But you still have to stay to enter the... <laughs> Just so you know, in case you're wondering. And this is a little bit about our website. And oh, the other, I forgot that I was doing this advertisement. If you're not getting our monthly newsletter, The Root, it comes out every month and it's free. You don't have to do $1.95 or $6.95. Just go put your name on there with your email address. And we do have past issues of Root out there for you to take a look at. And it's so comprehensive. It's not just one or two pages. It will give you a wealth of information about what's going on in North Texas. And a lot of times uh, articles are because of what goes, comes out on our help desk when we find out what's going on in Denton County. So it's a lot about what's going on in this area, not just in uh, Texas alone. 
Okay, so this is, I got started. I got my credits, right, for giving the advertisements in case people wonder. Uh, um, so let's take a look at where, how do you get started with vegetable garden. Let's look at bed preparation, pre preparing our beds. A little bit of something about raised beds, and I'll go into that uh, very shortly. Planning. How many of you plan to put in a garden this year? Raise your hand if you're planning. Oh, good. Some of you are thinking spring. But as Catherine said, the fall is a great time to be doing vegetable gardening. And if you're from the Northeast, that almost doesn't sound right. If you're, if you're from the northern parts of the United States, you go, you, ve you vegetable garden in the fall, really? Well, yes. Uh, it's a great time to do it. I'll give you some plant care tips. And if you ask a question, and if I don't know, I'll look around the room because I see a lot of my friends in here. I'm sure they'll be able to help out. Um, extending the growing season, uh, some tips on that, and a lot of resources. And remember, I said to you, you can pull this off the website, and there are a whole ton of resources out there. All right, so why would you grow a veg? Uh, a vegetable garden. Anybody give me one person, give me a, uh, why would you grow? So you can eat it. So you can eat it. Yeah, very good. Anybody, anyone else? Vegetables in the winter. Fesh, great. Pest pressures are lower in the fall. Oh, definitely. The pest pressures are uh, a lot lower in the fall. Pests, like yeah. bugs. Um, <clears throat> yes, exactly. Have you seen things diminish the pests? Oh, I would say we all diminish this summer, uh, for sure. All right, so a lot of the fall vegetables also taste better. Yeah. They taste better because the heat, you know, the heat doesn't drain. Another is your fewer challenges. So your, your example of fewer pests. I also think it's a good way to keep kids involved in gardening and that, that year round. If, uh, I know my grandchildren love to garden and they love to see how it grows. So fewer challenges, great. Fewer bugs, less damaging weather. That, and hasn't the weather been beautiful? That's why I congratulate you for being here today because this is a gorgeous day to be gardening. Uh, crops, uh, leafy greens, uh, especially the ones that are frost tolerant and they don't bolt because of the heat. Uh, I know well, when I planted some things like collard greens, they, they just keep going into the early spring until it gets really, really hot. So, I mean, you can grow some things that you can have some great crops. And because the days are shorter, um, the crops store more sugar. And so, again, they taste better. And to your point, they're healthier, right? They're a lot healthier. So here are some uh, crops. And I thought I took care of those little um, things when I pulled this off. But any of these up here surprise you? When you take a look at the list here, we have pole beans, bush beans, onions. I love to grow onions. Uh, turnips, kale. Peas, cauliflower, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, cool season herbs, um, cilantro grows very well in the fall. In fact, it really grows in the fall and not like the summer when you go out to the nurseries and you always see cilantro in the nurseries in the spring and then you wonder why they die or why it dies. It's because it's a fall crop, not a spring crop. So let's take a look at some of the things to get started. How, where are you gonna grow, right? Is it gonna be in the ground, raised beds, containers? You can grow in containers. Some people who have very limited um, space grow things very well in containers. Where's the location? Water, certainly. Um, the visibility, accessibility, how big? Um, I also say you can grow, uh, and if you go out, and you look at, I don't know how many of you ever look at Pinterest for gardens, but they grow uh, vegetables right between some of their flower beds. So it doesn't have to be a specific bed for vegetables. You can consider, look around your property and say, oh, okay, I have some space. Maybe I can grow some collard greens here because you know, collard greens are beautiful, all right? So you can grow them in some areas maybe that you didn't ordinarily consider. 
Um, some general guidance down here. If you eat the fruit, you need to have at least full, six full hours of sun. If you pick the leaves, you can have some partial shade. So think about that because in the fall, remember the sun is going to be different than is in the spring uh, or in the summer. And you might, uh, I at one time was a big time runner and I'd always say right around the end of August, the sun changes from that bright, bright white to that soft yellow glow and do you feel that now the so the sun is very very different so certainly consider that and consider the position what do you want to grow there's a lot out there uh i i had to laugh when i looked at this if your family doesn't like brussels sprouts and somebody told me they just planted brussels sprouts today right you told me that right i just put in some brussels sprouts well if your family doesn't like brussels sprouts why would you grow them right? Isn't that true? So I happen to love Brussels sprouts. So if you don't like them and decide to grow them, let me know and I'll come over and get them. But think about what does your family like? Definitely be adventurous, try something new, but start with some things that your family likes, things that they're going to get excited about, um, things that and things that you have space for. Get some inspiration from local vegetable gardeners. We have lots of master gardeners here. Get some inspiration uh, from us or get inspiration from a neighbor that you see that's growing and find out what do they do. They certainly uh, will volunteer uh, information. I have a neighbor that lives across the street and he loves to grow cabbage and he loves to grow turnips and he always brings them over to our house. I love that because he grows cabbage better than I do. And his wife doesn't like cabbage. So I'm the winner, right? <laughs> I'm the winner. So, yeah, and he loves to talk about his vegetable garden. So gardeners love to talk about it. So just ask them. Uh, get with a neighbor, extension office classes. Uh, a lot of our meetings are open to the public. If you're interested, thank you for signing up for the one today. So we offer it. There is so much information out there. Certainly take advantage of it. A lot of your local libraries have uh, programs not only in the fall, but in the spring. Uh, there's certainly Louisville does a phenomenal job. So does Flower Mound, Aubrey, Pilot Point. You can find them everywhere. So if you're unsure of what to do, um, certainly get look at in your local newspaper out on websites. And as I said, libraries for sure. And then talk with knowledgeable staff at local nurseries. Some nurseries are better than others. I would say if you have some of the smaller nurseries, they have knowledgeable staff. Sometimes when you go to big box stores, you get some information, but not as much as you might need. So, and you can always, and I don't know if Ann Hillman's in here, uh, help desk, you can always ask our help desk as well. You can send us an email and we'll be glad to answer your questions. And Facebook, North Texas Vegetable Garden, Vegetable Gardeners. And <laughs> do you love this last statement? When you see these beautiful pictures in the catalogs. How many of you are inspired by those beautiful pictures? I Yes, uh, but remember, look at the growing zones. And sometimes these catalogs are published somewhere other than here and they won't grow here, but they are wonderful to look at. So let's take a look at preparing your bed. I'm wondering, and when you look at this particular picture, how many of you have that much space to grow in? I ah, well, great, uh, great. But most of us don't. And so when you take a look at it, rows are uh, long and desired, although bigger is not better. All right. So uh, if you're like my neighbor who loves to grow rows and rows of cabbage and bring those over to me all the time, hooray for me and all our neighbors. But take a look at what you have and what you can grow. And so greater size sometimes provides greater harvest. Wide rows above the surface can help the drainage. So if you look at the way these uh, rows are uh, planted and then make sure you create pathways. I have a neighbor who is um, who brought in 
a lot of earth kind soil and she had the most amazing garden for the last two years, but you could not walk through her garden because everything receded. And so we ended up having to take quite a bit to get through it, but she produced an amazing crop of beets, an amazing crop of tomatoes. So make sure you have some pathway because otherwise I guarantee you won't be able to get through your garden. And then follow the instructions for soil preparation. And I'm gonna get into soil just a little bit here, but soil, if you um, don't have, uh, notice the first one, a poor gardener grows weeds, but don't let that be an indication that you stop. All right, think about, all right, weeds, something's growing there. All right, the next is a good gardener grows plants. And then the last, a great gardener grows soil. So when you have great soil, you're going to end up with a better crop. And Daniel's sitting back there going like this. He does a, a whole class on composting, um, which is uh, very valuable. So growing soil, even if you decide after this presentation, you know, my soil isn't just right, you can grow your soil in the fall and reap it in the spring. So be thinking about that. The soil is exceptionally important. And notice soil is not dirt, not like pig pen and uh, peanuts, you know, who's always walking around with this cloud of dirt around him. Uh, and people will say, well, this is dirt. No, soil. Um, dirt is what people and pets bring into the house. Soil is organic material, microorganisms, everything that plants need, that need to grow soil. They're nutrient rich. All right. So think about your soil. If I had, if you walk away with just one thing in this presentation, soil is of utmost importance. Uh, importance. And gardening sh soil should be loose enough that you can dig a planting hole with your hands. And that I think is the biggest challenge in North Texas is trying to, at least where I live, when I have this clay, or I should say also after the summer where everything is so compacted. So be thinking about your soil. And if you need to amend it, or you need to do something with it, now is the time to do it. And then maybe launch off in the spring. All right, so here are some, I almost thought about bringing this here where everybody could take a little bit when they told me there were gonna be a hundred and some odd people, I said, I'm probably not gonna work on this. But um, the determining your soil texture. So when you look at it, you feel it, rub it, uh, the moist soil between your uh, fingers. If it's sandy, it's gonna feel gritty. If it's silk, it's going to feel smooth and the clay is going to feel sticky. And there are certain um, uh, in North Texas, and I don't have a diagram of some um, soil, some yards, and I know my yard in, in particular has this sandy um, strip running through it. And then on the sides, it has clay. So just be aware, be, be aware of what your soil is. Uh, Ball squeeze test, it squeeze a moistened ball of, a ball of soil in your hands and the coarse texture will give you an idea if it's sandy, if it's loamy or if it's fine textures. And again, you can find this out on more about soil out there. You can, how many of you have ever had your soil analyzed? Because, all right, good. So you're well on your way to understanding what your soil is. So analyzing your soil will also give you a lot of information about what you need to do. The macronutrients nutri include nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The, the my, uh, micronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. But salt, uh, soil testing up here, you can get it done by Texas A&M. Uh, they'll give you the exact information on how to do it and you can get the results. And I believe, uh, let's see, uh, I'm sorry, the micro, I goofed on that. These are the, the micronutrients that you'll find in your soil testing. Let's see. Uh, all this information is out there on the Texas A&M educational site. And this is what you get back. And you'll notice um, the one thing they don't give you uh, information on is nitrogen. Does anybody know why you don't get nitrogen back on your soil testing? 
which is one of the most important, important ingredients. And in. nitrogen is very unstable. So what happens when they get the soil back or when they get it into the lab, they can't measure it because it is unstable. All right, so just be aware of that. If I'm looking for my nitrogen levels, um, you won't have that in your soil, but this is what you get back. And it will tell you if your soil is alkaline and you'll see this one, when you look at this for the pH on this particular um, soil test, they said the pH is 7.8, which said moderately alkaline. And then it gives all this other information about the nutrients. And you can take a look at it and you can decide, does it need more phosphorus, potassium, depending again on what you're um, growing. Add organic matter. And then this is where the composting comes in. To play. So it improves the ability of your soil to accept and store water. Um, I know, and I'll get into the far, um, the raised beds in a moment, because raised beds don't need uh, just 100% soil in it. You can pack it with some other things that can make a difference. But when you add other organic matter like leaves, newspaper, things that will break down, uh, trimmings from your uh, kitchen, they, it will help your soil accept and store water. It will also increase the activity and the number of soil organisms. So when you add like uh, kitchen scraps, like maybe lettuce or trimmings from your radishes or, or whatever, and you add it to the soil, it'll break down because you'll get worms and bugs and uh, other beneficial insects. Over time, a well-amended soil will supply all the nutrients your plants require. It will need very little fertilizer. So the better or the healthier your soil is and the more amended it is, it will reduce the amount of fertilizer that you put in with the exception of nitrogen. Although you might not expect it, adding organic matter to soil can also help protect water quality and environment by limiting the chemical runoff from into the shed. And how much? For landscapes, add at least three inches of compost, organic matter, and work it into six to eight inches of the soil. And how much for vegetables? six inches of compost into your soil because the vegetables require more nutrients. And add three inches of mulch on top of the soil to reduce the temperature. Um, mulch and mulch should repl be replaced every year because the mulch will break down into the soil. Uh, and we usually, one of the things that we recommend uh, when you're putting mulch down or if you're trying to reduce or limit uh, weeds, you can put down cardboard or you can put down heavy layers of newspaper because that will also break down into the so soil rather than using landscaping cloth. Okay. And here is a raised bed alternative. You can see several, um, several different ideas here. One is um, a totally all wood. And this one is made of cinder blocks. I, um, and I have mine, my husband made me one of sheet metal and a wood. It's about four by eight. And I would say four feet high because he's saying I'm getting older. So he was worrying about my back. So <laughs> therefore uh, the raised bed. And you might think a four by eight raised bed is pretty uh, large to fill with soil, right? Bringing soil in. So what we did, and it also maintains um, the moisture, is we put in logs, newspaper, cardboard, um, a lot of organic matter, and then we fill the other half with soil. And so as that breaks down, then we add more compost to it. So don't think just because you get a bed of this size, or a, a very large raised bed that you're going to have to go out and fill it with soil. You can fill it with other organic matter that will make a difference. A friend of mine does a lot of gardening 
in these uh, concrete blocks. And these, she uses them as the edge to her flower uh, garden and they work beautifully. So this is another way of putting something in or building a structure that you can grow in. So there are some advantages. Uh, you get better drainage in a raised bed. Uh, it discourages uh, grasses um, tall enough, and mine's tall enough for me to bend over. Um, I, I said four feet. I'm only five foot two, so I don't have to bend that far. Uh, and it also, it's functional. It's attractive the way um, it's situated in my garden. There's less soil that's compact, but remember part of the reason it doesn't compact a lot is because of the organic matter that I put in it. It's also, I did it in my keyhole garden, which is a, um, has a six foot sir, um, diameter to it. And I put a lot of logs and leaves and things in it. And that just also retains the moisture in your um, garden. So when you're selecting again, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, when you're um, your site selection, make sure that uh, you're going to get enough sun and you're able to water it. The size, um, think about the size. And remember, I, I also said that look in non-traditional places that you might be wanting to try um, some plants that like in, it, it could be in a rose bed, it could be on a rock garden. I mean, it can be anywhere because plant, to me, vegetables are beautiful when they grow. And you certainly, um, it and this is primarily for the raised bed and the place of where you're going to put the frame. And again, I'm not going to go through this because you can get this off the website of how to put it together. But this is just an example of one raised bed that you can do and what the materials that you can secure to put this together. So they do give you a soil calculator here. Uh, again, it's an example that's used over in the um, uh, in the presentation, but how to determine it, they give you the length, the width, and the depth, and it will give you the exact amount. So something that is 48 inches uh, long, 48 inches wide, with an inch of uh, 12 inch worth of depth, will require 16 cubic uh, feet of soil or a half a yard. So that's one reason why I suggest and half a yard is a lot of soil. And one reason why I suggest filling your garden bed with something other than just soil, I, you'll be a lot happier with it, I guarantee. And there it is, place of, uh, uh, on this presentation recommends putting a layer of cardboard on the bottom, which is al also a good, cardboard is great. How many of you ever use cardboard for landscaping? Oh, well, all my master gardeners, of course. How many non-master gardeners have used cardboard? Good. Well, you've been to our classes before. They know this stuff. This is great. Um, Adding gardening soil and compost to potting soil, um, the calculator will help you determine what you need as well as watering. Um, think about drip irrigation. I, I'm not sure, I didn't attend the class this morning when they taught, there was a drip irrigation uh, demonstration out here this morning, right? How many of you attend, got to see that? All right, good. Um, did you learn something? <laughs> it was worth the trip right <laughs> it was worth the trip one of the things i learned by tending master guard it wasn't as hard as i made it out to be so that's great i'm glad you were able to attend it so please come back to some of the other uh demonstrations that we do because we will provide you information on how to do drip irrigation and soaker hoses which which are great in uh flower beds. Um, add two to four inch your la layer of mulch and the mulch is helpful uh, when you're growing it to certainly keep the water in. And if uh, if you're doing a square foot garden, does anybody know what a square foot garden is? Well, I see my master gardeners shaking their head. All right, some who are is not a master gardener, who, where's the square foot garden? Lay it out here. 
square feet with wood. Slats. Right, wood slats. You can plant, like with lettuce, you can plant it closer together, but some you can only plant one, so you can use. You use a square, right? So here you have a little square, all 12 inch squares, and you can do your garden that way. So it doesn't have to be that long row or whatever. You can grow different plants in each square foot. And there's there's several books out there on square foot gardening. Also a great garden to have with kiddos, you know, kids, and they can put a different plant in each square. Good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, down the downside. So there are some downsides to raised beds. First of all, the cost of materials. I know that the ones that my husband made, each one cost about one hundred twenty-five dollars. So if you're going to have four or five of them, that you're getting into more of a cost. A uh, good rate. Uh, uh, Good drainage is certainly true for raised beds, but you do have to think about irrigation when you have raised beds because they do dry out a little faster. You need to add minerals uh, for the most of the important imported po potting soil. That's why I recommend putting organic matter in the bottom of them because once that organic ma matter tends to decay, you get water and nutrients that come up through the soil. And then the soil becomes hot during the summer and this could mitigate um, the use of uh, using mulch and plants that require a lot of growing room, such as melons, may not fit into a raised bed. And I thought that when I looked at this, it's kind of interesting because one of the things that I've done with raised beds for um, things that take over a lot, like melons, and I should have put a picture in there. I do have a picture if anybody wants to see it. Uh, we took cow panels, you know, those great big, uh, not panels, uh, the, what was that? Cattle panel. A cattle panel that you can turn. And we made huge trellises off of them. And I grow my cucumbers and watermelon, uh, not watermelons, cantaloupes on the cow panels. And if you don't think that a cantaloupe will hang from the cow panel, I can show you a picture of four or five of hanging there. So you don't, if you, you can think of ingenious ways of doing that. And so it runs between uh, my garden beds or these uh, cow panels that I know were quite interesting. I never thought they would hang there, but we had like um, two or three pounds just hanging there. So th that could be a consideration. If you're gonna do melons in your raised bed, where are you going to take those vines? And you can grow them up, up a fence, and they will hang. And I will show it to you if you don't believe me. <laughs> All right. Growing vegetables in containers. I mentioned that earlier. Certain things grow very well in containers. Um, and in case you're wondering why I have cow panels, we raise cattle, not on the land that I garden on, but we do graze uh, cattle uh, and I have great big mineral pots. So I grow potatoes in those great big plastic pots and, or bins. And so they don't have to be beautiful pots. They can be anything that is large enough to hold the potatoes. So and it even says even sacks that soil come in can provide you with a, a a place to grow, a container to grow it in. The one thing you have to remember is it does need a place for the water to drain out. So if you're using what that what is recommended here, a sack that soil comes in, you need to make sure there's drainage on the bottom. Uh, be sure that, the, as it says, it can drain and then check the moisture frequently. I, on the potatoes, I will tell you it just, I, I would go out and water them every couple of days and it worked just fine. You know, and, the, and what I did on the bottom, we did these great big holes that were about three inches in diameter. And then we did take some of our maintenance cloth and we put it on the bottom. So the, uh, the roots of the potatoes wouldn't go through. So planning, create a plan for plant selection and placement. Um, again, select vegetables that you would eat, but I also go out, if, if you're unsure if you'll eat it, a lot of uh, stores such as um, Whole Foods or Sprouts 
has a wide selection of produce, go look in the produce section, see what they're selling and try it. I mean, and then if you like it, grow it. Um, for fall, fall vegetables, choose plants that have edible roots, tubers, and leaves. Plants that need, um, that need flowers to produce fruit can be challenging in cooler weather, um, may, mainly because they need to be pollinated. If you have any tomatoes that are left over from the summer, and God save any tomatoes that were left over in the summer. And there are several gardens in my area that have some, and I did have a tomato plant I just pulled out, but you you can grow tomatoes until Thanksgiving. If you trim them back, you know, in July and they stay or you plant them in August, you can have a nice tomato crop. It was not, um, the tomatoes weren't up there, but you can grow tomatoes now. Uh, the biggest thing about tomatoes, you need a cooler evening for the plants to set. That's why they don't grow in July and August here because it's too hot in the evening. Uh, note the mature size of the plant to ensure the garden space. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, I, I really like herbs. So I was growing comfrey and comfrey is a garden hog and it took over one third of my garden bed, which is four by eight. Beautiful plant though. I, I also have bees, so they, they love. So think about the size of what you're growing and where you put it. And check again, the sunlight and use, a, here it's saying use a pencil and paper for a diagram. I, I will tell you, if you go out and you Google certain things, you can find more information than you ever knew about, because the next one is going to talk about companion planning. There are certain things, and again, and we don't have that much time to go into a lot of um, things about companion planning, but think about if you grow tomatoes, what herb goes really well with tomatoes? Basil. Well, grow your basil with your tomatoes, right? That would be a great way um, to do it. And so if you go out and think about uh, this, so here is a sample garden plan of things to consider. Um, they're also, when in this particular plan, um, it will tell you they have some basil with carrots and they also have basil with spinach. But the one thing you notice about basil, as soon as we have our first frost, what will happen? They'll die like immediately, right down to the ground. But if you have enough basil, it can recede itself and it'll come back to you in the spring, especially if your soil is rich. Remember, I said grow soil. So if you do some things around soil, some of these things uh, will come back. Uh, if you'll notice here, we have onions and we have all these onions together. Uh, one thing you may not know, you don't grow onions and garlic together because they don't grow together. And you don't grow, uh, you don't put uh, garlic in a bed that's had onions in it for three years, as I understand the last time I looked. So if you wonder why your garlic, I wondered one year why my garlic wasn't growing. Well, it was in my onion bed. All right. So that's one thing to consider as well. All right. This um, chart probably is one of the most important slides in this presentation is what the North Texas Vegetable uh, Garden Fall Planting Calendar. And you can take a look at this. You can, I can certainly bring this back at the end of the presentation. You can look at when you start. So for example, if you decided that you wanted uh, bush beans, bush beans to um, actually to begin to plant them should have been planted in August. Um, but this is out there uh, and also talks about what plants, and I believe I have a slide that what plants you want to plant by seed and what plants you would do better if you had gotten some transplants to do it. Um, but you can see you can be planting things like, look at cilantro here. And when do you see cilantro in the nursery? Always in the spring. I don't get that. 
but it is. And I couldn't, I tried to go grow cilantro three years in the spring and then figured that out. But the, that's another um, herb that when it grows really well and it likes it, it recedes itself all the time and comes back. Yes. Um, a star arrow, is that when you put the seed in or when you start? Oh, when you can, when you can, you can plant it anytime during this. So the stop arrow just means that you wouldn't plant it beyond that date beyond October or you wouldn't like bush beans you make sure you want to get it in in August so it wouldn't matter if it's the sea or the sprout uh, right point. it put it in at that point in time because what's going to happen is it's going to grow all the way through here and if you haven't planted it there it wouldn't have enough time to set to in in the ground okay thank you and you can see tomatoes in August and will grow. Um, actually, I've harvested tomatoes in November, right before Thanksgiving, because usually right before Thanksgiving, we have our first frost. And when I know we're going to have that, I usually pick all my green ones, wrap them in uh, newspaper, and then I have them for another couple of months. So, or I should say a couple of weeks around our house. But that's, uh, but you can see that tomatoes, but this is when you'd plant them in August. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Planting tomatoes in August, but that's when you do it. All right, here is, uh, again, this is another resource uh, available to you where you can select your county and it will tell you by region what is available. Every, every, uh, not everything that grows in a vegetable garden will do well in North Texas, but this is another uh, hyperlink for resources for you. So you can take a look at it. Different recommendations. This will give you also recommendations whether you use seed or if you use transplant. So if you see here, beets, arugula, arugula is great. Arugula will grow all through the winter, by the way, in this area. And I love it in the spring. My bees love it in the spring because that's when it bolts. And it certainly isn't good to eat, but it's good for the uh, pollinators. Uh, it's one of the things that before anything else, uh, beets, carrots, peas, radishes, uh, uh, transplants, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, eggplant. So if you can get transplants, you can make sure that they can grow. Spinach, uh, chard, kale will grow either way. And chard will grow very well here. I don't know how many of you like chard. I love chard. And chard a lot of times will be a perennial. If you can get it to set in your garden, I've had chard plants in my garden for as many as four years before they'll they'll die back. So they will live through the summer as well as uh, through the spring and the fall. If you're planting from seed, um, check the seed packets. If you buy um, botanical in interest uh, seed packets, they give you a lot of information on the inside of the envelope. So if you've ever bought one of those packets or if you have one at home and never looked on the inside of your envelope, they have a multitude, uh, a great amount of information on the inside of the envelope. So check uh, your seed packets, give you a lot of information. You can also check the um, websites of these companies that sell these seed packets will give you a lot of information. Um, soak the seeds overnight. Uh, small seeds can be soaked in a couple of hours and that'll just give them a great start. And you'll also find out if they germinate. All right, so when you're soak soaking them, you can just put out a paper towel and soak them and then you can plant them. Uh, the level of soil and dig straight down a trench to the desired depth. Again, look at the envelope. It'll give you a lot of information. Um, distribute them as evenly as possible. Um, not like my granddaughter who always just takes them and puts them in one clump right in the middle of the garden. I said, well, that's not, it'll grow, but we'll have to thin it out a little bit, you know, um, but she, she actually loves it. She's a great little gardener now. Um, distribute them. Sometimes it helps to mix small seeds with uh, coarse uh, 
sand and cornmeal. And sometimes when you do that, it'll help you sprinkle it out. It will also scarify the seeds, you know, break them up just a little bit to help them grow a little bit um, uh, faster because you've broken the seal on the side of the, of the seed. Um, pat the, the soil firmly and moisten the soil, moisten it. Notice it says moisten it. Don't don't let it sit in a lot of water. It, just to keep it damp until the leaves emerge, right? Until it gets a little bit stronger. And after they grow in the second leaves, um, the true leaves, you can thin them out to avoid overcrowding. I do have a, a friend who's a master gardener who sows a lot of seeds. And I love going over to her house because she always digs up the, when she's, um, avoiding overcrowding crowding she's giving me her stuff that's already germinated which is really great always get to know a gardener they love to share right we all love to share if you're planting vegetables from transplants um you can purchase or grow yours indoors. Sometimes people do. They have uh, lamps that grow them indoors. Uh, smaller nurseries may have a better variety of locally grown plants. And we have a lot of smaller nurseries here. And if there's something you want, just go talk to who owns the nursery. You know, on these smaller nurseries, a lot of times they'll get something or they'll tell you whether they can get it or where you can get it. Um, so you can do your own transplants. Uh, from seeds. Again, soak the container an hour or two before planting. Transplant on a shady day or early in the evening, or I would say sometimes early in the morning too, but early in the evening. I like to garden in the evening, so it, it's not a problem. And this is I think this makes sense to everybody. Um, oh, the, this it was except for this one thing on tomatoes. I have a slide there where you don't uh, when you plant a tomato, you don't plant it directly in the ground, you plant it sideways, right? You plant it sideways. Oh, surprised. Yeah, I'll show you the slide in just a minute. Does better that way. Oh, I, I got something they didn't know. That's great. <laughs> um, add a weak starter solution of manure, compost tea, or uh, fish emulsion. Compost tea is great. Uh, for a lot of things for fertilizing. Always recommend that. Manure, uh, that sometimes can, can be hard for people to find, but if you want some, I can give you some. Just let me know. We've got lots of manure <laughs> or fish manure. Um, plant, um, protect the plant from wind. And I think that's what killed a lot of things this year was the wind. We've had a lot of wind. It wasn't just the heat. It was the wind. I think in the early, um, late spring that really dried out a lot of things and water daily for the first week. But when it says water, that doesn't mean lots of water. It just means sprinkling with water because if you put too much water on it, you're gonna kill your plants. Um, again, growing uh, vegetables, the planting depth, it gives different depths for different um, plants here. Uh, again, it just depends on on what you're go, uh, growing. And they said, what about uh, tomatoes? I'm not sure. What about tomatoes? Patio here again, it's growing them in containers. Uh, again, it makes sense to you. Look at the seed packet. It will tell you the depth of the plant and what it needs to. I don't know. I'm, I'm going on what... Uh, well, I'm not sure. This is for container growing. This is mainly for container growing. All right. All right, so let's look at the salad greens. And you can get salad greens to last all fall into the winter, especially if you get really cold days and you cover them with a, a garden cloth just so they, they don't get frostbite. But our winters are mild enough for the most part, and you've heard me say that, and I'm praying that we don't have one of those snowmageddons. Although some, some of my plants lasted through that awful winter we had two years ago, but they will grow all year long, so you can have fresh greens. And um, 
I remember one of my neighbors saying something to me uh, about the greens, because when she pulled up the lettuce in her garden, and this is the one who didn't put any rows in between her garden, she pulled up the whole lettuce plant. Well, you don't pull up the lettuce plant, you just take the lettuce leaves off and it will last all, all winter long. I mean, until it gets very, very hot gets above 75 degrees. So you have choices of different leaf lettuces, romaine, spinach, mescaline, chard. Um, but chard, ch to me, chard is pretty hardy. Uh, chard will grow into the um, summer. I've had it last that long. I don't always pick it in the summer because it's a little tougher. I just pick the leaves off and then in the fall again, they'll be more tender. Yeah, chard, chard's pretty uh, hardy and arugula. And this just goes into, they're recommending fertilizing with blood meal here. I tend not to do that because I have a lot of wildlife. So I go more to the fish meal or um, I use manure as well as compost tea. Um, let's see, let me, here are some cruciferous vegetables. Uh, and then they're, they've, uh, you plant it from September through February, up through February, because it will produce up and through through the end of April when it's not too hot. Um, heavy feeders use frequent and small applications of nitrogen-rich fertilizers, which would be something like fish emulsion. Um, it requires small amount of supplemental water if the conditions are dry. But again, in the winter, if if you have a, a raised bed and you have water coming up or if, if it's well composted and you have a, a water source from the bottom, which I mean those leaves and those logs and things, you don't have to water them very frequently. And using the irrigation system, you know, the drip irrigation, we didn't water every day and we had a nice crop. All right, let me just see. All right, and here's more about cabbage. If you're interested in cabbage, cabbage is uh, harvested within three to four months, broccoli in 60 to 80 days and cauliflower 60 to 80 days. So, you know, if you're planting now, you're gonna have a great Thanksgiving. Think about that, right? And Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are fun to grow, whether you eat them or not. They're fun to look at. They get all on the stock. But I love Brussels sprouts, so let me see. And uh, here's more about um, turnips. Um, turnips are harvested when they use a reusable size. Uh, I don't know how many people here like turnips, but white turnips are great for a salad. You can eat them raw. I don't know if you've ever eaten them raw, but they're uh, great. Pardon me? They're the, they're the best raw. Yes, they are very, very good raw. Bok, bok choy um, are great, especially little bok choy. When you grow them, you harvest the whole plant. Kale leaves uh, may be harvested any time when they reach uh, full size, uh, as well as uh, kale also. You may think about just eating it as uh, a salad. It's great in soup just like collard are great in soup and ch uh, chopping it out. Uh, kohlrabi uh, harvested two, three inches. Radishes, great time to grow radishes also in the spring too. And they grow quickly. So radishes are really good um, to start with kiddos because they will they they can be harvested within a month and um, they're great. And collards within 70 days. But like I said, they'll last all until the spring. And mustard greens harvest when they're younger, young and tender. Here, special plants. Here, here, here's my tomato diagram. When you're planting tomatoes, plant them sideways, right? So it's when you have this, take off these uh, leaves on the bottom and plant it this way. You get a much better, they do better that way. And you can also pull off, and I'm not remembering those little, what is, suck, thank you. I, 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 you pull the suckers off, they'll grow tall. But yes, in your tomato plants, you should plant um, and set them at an angle. 
And I do that in the spring as well as in um, for summer. And every, a lot of people like tomatoes and they are uh, certainly a big nitrogen feeding plant. So you should feed them. Uh, transplants early in July, um, certainly protect it with mulch, especially in the, in the heat of the summer. Keep moist uh, and be careful to keep the water off the leaves. A lot of times people just take uh, a hose and hold them over the leaves. Really water leaves on the bottom, water the plant from the bottom. And during the heat, uh, the plant will grow a good root system. The flowers will not appear until the cool of September. Remember, the, the, the fruit won't set until September, all right, because the nights are too hot, all right? That's why it stops producing fruit in July and August. If you can keep them alive, you will definitely, I guarantee you will have tomatoes for Thanksgiving dinner, all right? if you want them. All right, uh, choose varieties that mature quickly. Again, look at the little uh, tags on uh, that are in there that'll tell you when you're gonna get the crop. But as soon as the first frost comes, they're gone. They are gone, I will. All right, and it says, if it's cool weather, pick your green tomatoes. And if you like fried green tomatoes or wrap them in newspaper and, and they will ripen. Here are sweet potatoes. Uh, North uh, Texas is really great for sweet potatoes. We, um, some of the bigger crops in the United States come from this area. So if you'd like them, I would suggest that um, you grow them. And, and here's a whole example of how to grow uh, organic sweet potato from the market. Basically, it's just, if you remember as a child, poking um, toothpicks around, the, and setting it in water, you can use that. And you can use those offshoots to, to plant your sweet potatoes. Herbs, lots of herbs grow in, in, this, um, in the fall. Certainly dill, rosemary, rosemary is all year round. Uh, flat leaf parsley, uh, as well as curly leaf parsley. Parsley is a biennial plant. It, it's two years, it's not an annual, it's biennial. You'll know it's uh, in the nursery if you go and it looks really uh, full. And if it starts to get a shoot up, that's when it's gonna throw its seed. So it's, it's a two year plant. Um, chai, oops, sorry. Um, chives is also uh, a good plant to harvest in the fall, marjoram. These are all really great and there's, they didn't put cilantro in there, but cilantro is also for the, the fall. Just some suggestions on how to extend your growing season. Again, it depends on what kind of bed you have. Here are some examples of some uh, tunnel hoop houses that you can protect them. But if you also have a uh, garden bed, you can just put stakes in a raised bed and put something over those stakes just to cover them so they don't get frostbit. Um, that's the, the biggest thing. But this also, um, people use hoop gardens and to start early crops in the spring too. So again, it's all a matter of planning. Uh, here's some examples of some greenhouses um, that you can um, purchase if, if you're interested to help you with your seedlings as well as to extend your growing season. Uh, it certainly is a dream, a real greenhouse. I, it, it certainly would be a dream of mine, but that brings a whole another <laughs> set of things to do, right? All right, and here is a whole list of resources. I mean, I packed it off. I went through a lot in a very short period of time. Um, but again, you can pull this presentation off our website with all this information, because there is a lot here. Um, I hope that you walk away with at least one or two things that you didn't know before or inspired to grow something, or at least inspired to join us, right? I'll answer, I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Okay. No. <laughs> Oh, 
He's going to give you another one. All right. Oh, the batteries are out. Oh, here. How about we do this while you're doing that? All right. Go ahead. Do you use worm casings, the tubes that you make out of PVC in your beds? The worm castings? And, okay. I do not. But uh, any of the master gardeners here use worm casings? I see some people raising your hand. They're expensive, but they're good. What if you make it by yourself? Have you ever made it? Had you made it, Linda? Oh, no, I, I, no, she's not talking about that. A PVC. She's talking about something different. Hold on. No, it's a, it's a PVC thing that you build and you put worms and dirt and you dump your comp, your like your vegetable trimmings oh, okay. and stuff so in it and the worms eat it. A, a, a key, key. It's similar to a keyhole garden. So yeah, it's very similar to a keyhole garden. A keyhole garden is a garden that's circular, that has like a little cutout that you walk into. And in that cutout, that's where you put your compost and everything. Well, this actually has like red wiggler worms in it. Yeah. It's a tube and you put your- I've never used that. And stuff and the worms eat it and then they oh, yeah they that play. sounds marvelous but i've never used it anybody have you ever used it no i, I one time i did a it's just a pvc pipe with a perforated pvc pipe in the garden but the thing is that if you have worms in a perforated pvc pipe inside of your veggie gardens you really have to keep up on feeding that tube because they're as soon as the food is done, they're going to go out. They're going to go out, right? And so you have to keep reattracting them. It can be tricky, but it's not impossible. Yeah. Oh uh, no, poor guys. Let them go yeah, out. You want to? You want kind of want? Let so, them go do their work in the veggie garden. When I I'm talking about the keyhole garden, I use um, a chicken. Chicken, chicken screen. We yeah, use, that uh, chicken screen or uh, another hardware uh, cloth. Yeah, hardware. No, not hardware cloth. This is like um, where it's very open and it sits in the middle of the keyhole garden. That's where I put all the compost. So the worms can come and go as they please. <laughs> oh, all right. Is there any more questions? Okay, I'm sure there is. I'm walking that way. Harvest. How do you harvest um, garlic chives and then what do you do with them? Well, I harvest garlic chives by just cutting them. You know, no, I just cut pieces. I, I just cut stems off of them like the onion, just the green part. And then I just cut them and I use them in salads or um, primarily that's what I do with them. I, I don't pull the whole plant out. That That is a, um, that will take over a lot too if you put it. They, it's pretty prolific. I have mine in a mineral tub. I All right, good. For like three years, and I, I use them a little bit, but I just think they're huge. Yeah, well, you can divide them, and you can give them to other people, too. Oh, good idea. Yeah, Thanks. cut them up. All right. <laughs> okay, so how do you store, you know, your vegetables and everything to keep them alive or, I mean, fresh for a long period of time? Do you have any um, best practices like freezing them or I know you mentioned okay. putting them, wrap them up in newspaper. Oh, well, so those are the tomatoes. What about um, aluminum what, soil? Or, what never. about? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so spinach, you can just wash it and then put the whole spinach, freeze it, you know, wash it and dry it and freeze it like that. Um, I do a lot of freezing depending on, so I just put up, um, so there's a couple of things I've done recently that I can tell you about, all right, that I've done personally. I've taken okra. Okra is pretty prolific in the summer. And the, um, you can do a vinegar bath with okra and just, uh, you don't have to parboil it, boil it, or even put it in a steam bath or anything. You can just put it in that pickling solution. Um, beets I've roasted and put into a pickling solution. Uh, black eyed peas I par uh, parboiled and frozen it. Okra, I can, will also cut it up and just freeze it. Eggplant, I'll roast it and, you know, I'll cut it up into half or quarter to half inch pieces and roast it with oil and then just freeze the, the rounds. 
Uh, peppers, you can just cut up and you can freeze peppers. Um, the tomatoes, the thing about tomatoes, I think you really have to process them in some way, like make a sauce or something because they get so watery when you freeze them. You know, that at least that's been my experience in doing it. But tomatoes never stay around my house. We always seem to eat them and we give them away. So I, it's not something I work. Tommy, yeah. should we explain uh, to the uh, gardeners the difference between determinate and indeterminate plants? I would love for you to. <laughs> I'm not the specialist. I, I determinate and indeterminate. We have somebody right here who'll do that. Okay. As in blackberries, you have determinate and indeterminate. Your determinate ones are going to uh, become ripe and going to be ready to pick all in about a week, 10 days. Your indeterminates are going to come ripe. Don't cut them, pick them, because a month later or three years later, they're going to come ripe again. So they will produce twice a year. Okay. Uh, and the determinate ones will produce once. Once a year. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Once a year, uh, twice a year. Thank you. I learned something new today. Thank you very much. Did that answer the question about the yeah. tomatoes? Was someone asking that about the tomatoes, the yeah. determinate and the indeterminate? I don't think so. No, they were asking about how to uh, how to preserve them. That's what they were asking. <laughs> and the little cherry tomatoes will last from one year to the next if you cover them. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's covering them. We'll okay, we have one more question here. Okay. Um, what are some small local nurseries that you recommend going to? Oh, that's that's a hard one. We usually don't recommend. I'll tell you local. I will tell you local nurseries that are around that you can go to. Just know they're not necessarily a recommendation, but they're smaller nurseries. So there's Four Seasons on 380. There's the Plant Factory. There's Metters. Um, there's a new nursery up in Pilot Point called Rooted In. Uh, DNL Nursery. Uh, I, I know they have a pretty wide variety of plants. Uh, Dennis's, Dennis's Painted Flower. There are a lot of great nurseries around. Usually your smaller nurseries are more accommodating to what you want. If you see something that you want, they'll more than likely order it for you. Or And that's why we usually go to smaller nurseries is for that reason. Yeah. Shades of Green is great. That's in uh, Frisco. There's North Haven Gardens in Dallas. I mean, I... Any master gardener here will tell you nursery. So we will go far for a nursery. <laughs> if it's selling something we want, we will go. I assure you. All right, one more here. I'm, I'm going around row by row because I can tell there are like 78 questions to be asked. So. Have you ever grown golden beets here? Uh, a friend of mine grows golden beets. I have not. They do great. Yeah. I mean, her golden beets got really big. Yeah, big, big. One more. I've been growing lettuces the last couple of years, but I'm finding I'm not harvesting them correctly. And I've gone to YouTubes and I see it different ways. You harvest from the top, the bottom. What's the best way? Well, I always harvest from the sides. I don't know about, yeah, from the sides. I Yeah. Or did you have a recommendation, Dan? No question right here. I was, uh, we we're just, uh, I guess maybe seven of us saying like, yeah, just go from the bottom outside. Yeah, the, you know, yeah, the bottom on the side. Just, from, yeah. And then they just continue Yeah, the to oldest things first. Yeah. And sort of like stop them as well from kind of like laying on the soil. You tend to forget about it. You lost a few. Right. So you're clearing the bottom of the plant. Is there any more questions on I, this side over here? Over here. No. I'm jumping to the to the other side. Okay. Friends. Okay. I had a question about tomatoes. I planted two tomato plant starts a couple of years ago, and by the end of the summer, they had taken over like the entire garden. 
So would you recommend? Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Would you and, recommend and, and a problem writer or <laughs> I just I ran out of room to grow anything else. Well, see that is so I would take a look at what variety you're growing because some as I mentioned earlier, I have a couple of plants that will just take over. So take a look that the seed packet or um, wherever you bought it from, there should be some information about how wide and how tall the bush, you know, the plant will get. So what's it? What's it? Right, so yeah, you can. Put, those are good also, from a friend, so those are the best ones. Those are the best ones, but also to sucker them. Do you know what I mean by taking the sucker off? So the sucker, when you see the the uh, plant growing this like this, there's a little plant that comes up in that V. Just uh, snip it off, and that that will help. Okay, and we'll also produce more fruit. That is very true. Okay, coming around this way. <laughs> Hi, could you tell us your approach to pest management? Uh, my approach, my approach is that, I, and I'm sure everybody has a different approach. My approach to pest man management is a balanced garden. Remember I mentioned to you, we have bees. Uh, we have a, a large variety of bees, not only mason bees, but um, bumblebees and honeybees. I have some hives in the garden. And I really try to have a diversified uh, garden that is a little bit messy. I always say um, I have a little bit messy uh, garden just so insects, good insects will grow. I use, I, I will tell you, I don't use a lot of pesticides and I, I will own up to using pesticides on fire ants, but I, I, we don't use pesticides in our garden. Uh, there is a, and sometimes when we've had a, a huge infestation of grasshoppers, um, which I think in the last couple of years, this year wasn't so bad, but a couple of years ago, it was awful. We uh, got, a, and I'm trying to remember the name of the clay. It was like a- Kaoli clay that we mixed with water and we sprayed on the leaves and it prevented uh, the grasshoppers from eating the crop. And you can wash that off and it's not certainly anything that would cause any problems to humans. But I, I believe if you're eating it, why would you want to spray things on it? And in general, if you have a balanced garden with nutritious soil and you invite um things into your garden, they're going to be fine. I mean, they really are. I think we've used too many pesticides and the more you use, the more problems you have. I, that's been my experience and that's my approach. Yes. Nasturtiums and some of the nurse plants, the bugs will go to right. and sell their vegetables. Exactly, yeah. But you can eat nasturtiums too. Well, you can. I Yes, nasturtiums are beautiful. I, you talk about that in herbs. Um, but yes, look at like squash bugs. Look for, which are awful, those little buggers. Um, using Hubbard squash to d distract them. Just do some research. What will attract the insect you want to get rid of rather than killing it? attract it somewhere else, have it go somewhere else, because we're going to be in a whole lot of trouble if we lose our insects. Yeah, that's true. Questions, questions up there. I have a two parter. Um, one is to answer the garlic chive mm -hmm. inquiry. What I like to do is cut the flowers off when they're just at their peak. Make sure you got all the insects off and then put them in a jar with white vinegar. And then you have vinegar flavored, uh, garlic flavored vinegar for salads. It's good. And it can sit there. They can stay for months in that because the that <clears throat> kind of pickles them. And the other question is for you. What do you do with your comfrey? I really, I don't do much with it except let it attract the bumblebees and my re regular bees. I just happen to love comfrey. It is just a beautiful plant that dies back every year and then just comes back. I I would say on my phone, I have a picture of a bumblebee. I do not. I 
personally, I just like to look at it the way it is. I'll show you my picture with my bumblebee. I, I love comfrey. It's one of my favorites. Oh, wait a minute. There's one more question. Y'all making me walk all over, all over the room. At the end of the day. I just wanted to add something about comfrey. It's a great fertilizer. It's a great yeah. chop and drop mm -hmm. fertilizer. So yeah. you can mulch with it. So yeah. It's a great, and you don't see it a lot. And I mean, in nurseries or you don't see it. No, you have to find someone who grows it and it does well here because there's a lot of varieties that don't. Yeah, well here. it does grow very well. But be prepared. It is a garden hog. It will. It will. Got Any more questions, my friends? Oh, last one. Sure. Okay. So All the way to the front. Is it too late to plant any kind of onion? I mean, is there oh, no, I don't know. I, I, I want to start planting onions but now. That's for spring harvest, not fall harvest. Uh, well, I guess I well spring spring I put it in in January, but I I would plant them now. I mean now garlic too. People plant garlic now. So you can I, plant any kind of onion now. I would plant it. Yeah. Well, it depends on the onion. Try yeah. uh, green onions for sure. Green I would plant now. Green onions would be because the scallions, the green scallions, I would plant them now. And yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. They grow pretty fast. More questions? Nice. Great turnout. Great turnout. I, I think it's great. Thank you.